Hello and welcome to episode 198 of Pop Culturally Deprived, where each week we watch a movie I've never seen before, which is most of them, and talk about the good, the bad, and the throat singing. This week we're going to be talking about Bill and Ted Face the Music on your MP46 podcast. The reference to it being MP46, as an American, do you go, well, that's a mile post? No, okay. because the ones in North Carolina don't have MP on them. They're just numbers. Okay. So I did not pick up on that reference until they found it at the end. Okay, fine. Because obviously we don't have them in that same way like that. Mm. Um. So I wondered if it was quite obvious to people in America. May it, it, is it that it is used in some states and they might get it? Probably. Mm. Okay. But I doubt anybody would have thought. I mean, given the rest of the the movie, like yeah. I don't think anybody's first thought was going to be, "Oh, that's at a mile marker on an interstate," right? <laughs> like I, I doubt it. Okay. But. Okay. Episode one ninety eight. Episode 198, we're getting close. We're probably finishing off. And this is this is one of the franchises that we've gotten more than one film into that we probably need mm-hmm. to finish off. Probably need to? Probably. Uh, for, this is a <laughs> significant franchise for me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've, go back and listen. We've covered Bill and Ted, Action and Adventure. We've covered, covered Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, which is one of my favourite comedies of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I loved these two and these films growing up. And I was delighted to share them with Mandy, that Mandy loved them so much as well. I did. And during the course of us making this podcast, rumours gathered strength about a new Bill and Ted film, and finally a new Bill and Ted film was made. And I So many times you were like, nope, it's not going to happen. I don't believe it. They've been saying it for 20 years. I am not going to get my little heart up. And it finally, finally happened. And I said on one of those podcasts that I would not believe there was a new Bill and Ted film until I am sat in a cinema watching it. And as that has not yet happened, there is still no <laughs> Bill and Ted 3, frankly. The pandemic <laughs> has happened to stop me from seeing this film. <laughs> well, in no, because now you've seen it. We are talking about it today. You just didn't see it in a cinema. No. And I, and I do hope at some point it might get a cinema, because it, it was out very briefly in the cinemas over here. But then mm-hmm. we've been in lockdown for a pretty long time, quite severely. So, yeah. um uh, hopefully at some point I'll get to watch it, but I got to watch it at home on you know the massive TV with the new surround sound speakers and stuff. So I, I will take that because <laughs> frankly, if I'm not going to the cinema, I'm bringing the cinema here. <laughs> right. Oh, it's so hard being you, Matthew. <laughs> We've covered far sequels before. Mm-hmm. I found out there there is a there is different terminology. There is distant sequel and there is far sequel. What's the difference? Distant sequel is, and this is a distant sequel because it is a chunk of time since the previous films. Okay. Okay. A far sequel is where there is a chunk of time in the real world since the previous film. Okay. So The Godfather Part 3, oh, I think is both because there is actually a chunk of time in the world as well, isn't there? That's 20 mm-hmm. years too. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of a film that doesn't have, that is a far sequel. That is not also a distant sequel. Well, you're putting me on the spot. Yeah. I feel like we I feel like for sure there's one that we've watched recently, but it my brain has gone absolutely blank. No. Uh, and we have done a few. I was thinking about this, you know, because we did Tron Legacy recently. Mm-hmm. Um we've done Godfather Three. We've done Ghostbusters twenty sixteen, which arguably is not a sequel, but at the same time has some of those traits applied to it. And we and we've done a few others. We haven't done the Blade Runner sequel. And we're never going to, Mandy. Uh, Wait, we no, I guess we didn't. <laughs> I mean, Blade it's... Runner 2049 was infinitely better than Blade Runner. Oh, have you seen it? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. infinitely better. I mean, it's not hard what's, to be better than yeah, Blade what's, Runner. Yeah, what's zero times infinite? Anyway, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is not that show. No, um, no, it's not. This is the one even more so than The Force Awakens, I think. And a few others, mm-hmm. 
that I think is very much aimed at me. They are releasing this film because of people like me. People who over the years have talked about Bill and Ted, have shared Bill and Ted with other people, have still engaged with it and made references to it. Like, right. Force Awakens is a far sequel. It was a distant sequel, but Star Wars never went away. It wasn't like Tron Legacy where people went, oh, I remember that thing. I used to love it. I would love to see it again. Oh, it done right. in a modern fashion. It's like it's Star Wars. We've had Star Wars in many forms of media over the years. Fine. Mm -hmm. Bill and Ted was short-lived, two films, an animated series and some comics. Right. And there's been nothing since. So this film is going to be working hard on my desire for fan service perhaps mm -hmm. my desire for factor. those characters again and mm -hmm. a, a, and seeing more of them but another story with those people okay that was that was my thoughts going into this okay it was it was a, a, an interesting experience because usually i don't go into distant sequels because i'm not the person distant sequels are made for far but sequels this one whatever. Was absolutely made for you and this absolutely was and you're in a slightly different position than that yes because this isn't for me. This isn't a distant sequel. I just watched Ooh. Bill and Ted in the last couple of years, and so this is just an exciting continuation of something that's new in my life. Okay. And of course, we all know that I have some deep, abiding Keanu love now. Yes. <laughs> because of this podcast, <laughs> and so getting to see him do something again, mm -hmm. particularly that's taken him away from the matrix slash john wicks of the world mm. um it, it was something that i was really excited to see yeah because that's you're absolutely right that is the other side of it we did a keanu month we've watched mm -hmm. point break and constantine we've watched the matrix films we've watched the bill and ted films we've watched john wick films he might be our most watched actor of this show possibly and i just finished playing cyberpunk 2077 where and he mm. is quite a main character of that whole story. Absolutely. So, like, Keanu is just everywhere in my life now. And, and in the meantime, I've watched As Good As It Gets and The Private Lives of Pippa Lee and Always Be My Maybe, which he plays, you know, key love interest in, as well as probably some other Keanu films. Mm -hmm. We do love Keanu. We do. Mm. It's a shame he's one of my problems with this film, isn't it? <laughs> wondering how you felt about this movie it's a real shame <laughs> um how do you feel about this so this is not pop culture Five matthew edition we never talked about this this is how does mandy feel about this film um i loved this movie except for the parts with bill and ted <laughs> 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 this was like two movies and half of it was really really good mm -hmm. like the part of this movie that was all of the good parts of Bill and Ted. So young B and T going time traveling and getting the folks from the band. I loved that whole thread. Okay. All of the stuff of Bill and Ted going to the future, tracking themselves down. Mm -hmm. It was boring and redundant mm -hmm. and served no purpose. Other than to continually introduce a multitude of time travel paradoxes. Yeah. Yeah. It kills me. It kills me. But overall, I enjoyed it. And the ending was nice. So that, yeah, that is kind of the two sides of it for me, but slightly differently. I, I don't think okay. I've thought about it in those terms. So I think as we talk, I might I might come to some of those realizations. Um, okay. I, I'm very disappointed with this in the obviousness of the story, mm -hmm. in the obviousness of some of the choices they made, in the lack of maturity in a number of aspects mm -hmm. of the story there was no character development for bill and ted in mm. the last 25 years no. and i did not expect that uh, and that it's really it's a really disappointing choice because mm -hmm. wouldn't it be great if keanu was keanu ted <laughs> was <laughs> bearded and grizzled and sour or something or mm -hmm. if this film so, uh, in watching it again last night because i watched it when i came out on digital release a while ago and then I watched it again last night to refresh and there is a whole thing early on about the princesses are possibly going to leave them 
mm-hmm. and, and saying about, you know, this time has been hard for us and that's why they want to go to therapy and all this sort of thing, which is, is slightly weird because after 25 years, I, I, I don't quite buy that it's taken them 25 years to get to this point when, when we saw them get engaged in that first, in, in the second film. It's that beautiful scene where they're doing the, the two proposals, which are the same words, but slightly different. And then they say, will you marry us? And the princesses look at each other and then say, yes. You know, they, they know what they're getting into here. They know that these guys come as a pair and they are going to be a couple of couples. Right. Fine. But now it's changing and they're possibly losing them. And suddenly there's a possibility of a story where these guys have never written the great song because they've never had trouble in their lives. And that's why there's no character development, because they've always had things served to them, and they've always been easy, they've always been able to be themselves, because they had such success early on. And actually going through losing their wives and having to grow up allows them to write a song of some maturity, and being a person in the world that is the great song. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, that that would have been fun, but they never go that, no, never go down that route. Right. Um, but there's the maturity of the time travel, and the the, the hell stuff. I mean, Bill and Ted is, is important because certainly that first film came out at a time where we were starting to mess really properly around with um, doing a lot of interesting stuff on film with time travel and actually being able to see the different things and, and a more mature audience being able to understand the concepts of it. Mm-hmm. And that if you say, actually, if we go to earlier and steal the keys, we could put the keys here now so right. we can steal them and get away and then once this adventure is all over we can go and steal the keys and that's why mm-hmm. the scene at the beginning the keys were not there right. and the film doesn't necessarily explain that to you it just expects you to keep up and that's great and we've gone from that to end game and you know modern time travel films which go into a lot of detail and a lot of ideas around it mm-hmm. i don't think they do that here you're absolutely right there's a lot of paradoxes a lot of a lot of things they could have done a really interesting multiverse thing mm-hmm. well hey Ted, dude, if we've written that great song, maybe we've written it on another Earth. What if we use the booth to go to another Earth and find other Russes? And that's why you get to see all the different variants of them and the way their lives turned out. Something like that. Mm -hmm. That would have been more interesting. Yeah, but they use time travel for it. And then it's a bit weird because it's like, why didn't they just go straight to the end of the story? (laughs) Why did the people in the future not say, oh, here's here's a copy of your song. Go and play it. Right. It doesn't make sense because... So when they got to the first, before they ever got to the old people, they got to the drunk people and then the lying people and then the prison people. Prison people. Right? They went through all of these iterations <laughs> yeah. of themselves who had never written the song. Mm-hmm. If they had never written the song, they wouldn't exist. And that timeline wouldn't exist. Yes. According to the rules that Bill and Ted has established. Yes. Yeah. And that's why it got to be so frustrating for me Mm. because they kept trying to find the song in the future because if the future exists, they had to have written a song, Mm -hmm. but they kept going to futures where they didn't write the song. Yeah. (laughs) And it just made my head explode. And then clearly they did write the song because the old guys played the song for them. And that's the song they then play when they get their guitar piece at the end at 717. Right, so how did the old guys have it from that night yep. when the guys in the middle didn't have it? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. If you pull those threads, it just completely unravels. It's very strange. So, there's there's that side of it. Like, this, this mm-hmm. story, after all the years in development and thinking about it and coming up with plots, should have been way stronger. Yes. I think. I think. And, and you're right, there's then the other side, the, the, the other thing that you've got the girls time traveling their daughters time traveling to form a band which mm-hmm. is quite nice because you've only got beethoven in the first one as a musician and, and other than that it doesn't actually really deal with music at all mm-hmm. which for a film where for two people where music is so important it, it's slightly strange so it's kind of fun to go through time and pick up all these different musicians and so on mm-hmm. fine but it's just more plot on a very thin plot already. There are other ways of doing that thing. And there are other things I think they could have done. I feel like the as soon as they start saying a song played by Preston Logan, you go, ah, so you're not saying Bill and Ted anymore, despite the other films talking about Bill and Ted and the great ones and the statues of Bill and Ted and it being right. Bill and Ted University. And now suddenly you're not using the phrase Bill and Ted. 
I wonder what that could mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Uh, yeah. Such a clever film. I can't unravel it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I picked up on that pretty early too. Yeah. But again, that's a paradox. Because it was always supposed to be Bill and Ted. Like the people in the future would know that this wasn't Bill and Ted. It was little Bill and Ted. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and I, I think they even tried to establish the thing that it's the, the fact that all time is happening at the same time. So that's why you can change it and affect it and so on. But mm-hmm. again, it sort of contravenes some of the. It's a little late in the game. I mean, and they even talked about how they changed things in this because now it's not just uniting like the world. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden time and reality are a part of it. And save all of time. Is that new? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um. It should have been better than it was, given they had 25 years to work on it. Yeah. Yes. And even I even did... if it was only in the last three or four years they started working on it, mm-hmm. we can very quickly come up with something that is more profound and more interesting than what we got. Yeah. I think. Yeah. This was mostly, I think, focusing on the nostalgia factor. Like us getting the chance to see Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves doing what they do. Yeah. That's what this movie was. Yeah. This wasn't a Bill and Ted movie. It was an Alex and Keanu movie. It, it was it was fan service. In mm-hmm. I, I tried to look up fan service. Fan service seems to be much more about like having anime characters in skimpy clothing than what I've always <laughs> considered fan service. And, and I wonder if that's the start of it. Is it's fan service-y because it's your favorite women looking mm. slightly saucy so that you buy the comic book, buy the yeah. Manga. Um, was I consider fan service to be things like R two D two and C three PO in Star Wars sequels? Um, you know, and yeah. and this film, this film is very yeah. heavy fans of it. The fact death is in it, and having George Carlin references and so on. That's all fan service. Fine, and I don't think it necessarily works on a fan service thing because it's disappointing that they haven't changed. Mm-hmm. Alex Winter. And it was a really interesting thing I read that Alex Winter actually went back to acting lessons because mm. because he's become a filmmaker in his own right in the intervening years and hasn't actually acted in so long. He went to go and have coaching and lessons to get back into the swing of it. And he's very clearly picked it up again to play Bill again. Mm-hmm. But he's playing Bill exactly as he was. Fine. Fine. You know, I can forgive it. Keanu is trying to play Ted as he was. And Keanu is not Ted as he was. Keanu Mm-mm. is a deep, dramatic actor who suits a beard, frankly. <laughs> yes. Seeing him without the beard is really strange. And seeing him trying to, oh, I'm doing funny, silly lines. Oh, come right. on, dude. And, we've and got the to way go do he this. moved his arms and shoulders, like you're doing that our yeah. listeners can't see you doing right now. <laughs> like when he came on screen, and I saw him do that. My immediate reaction was, old Keanu is playing old Ted and nothing has changed. And this is weird and mm. it's bad and it's a little bit embarrassing. Yeah. Like, that's... <clears throat> it just... That, that, that's... Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't quite work for me without the change in the character because Keanu himself has changed. So, that's... It's difficult, and it makes the film worse because it is there, I think. And, and it, it leaves me disappointed with, as a fan, what the fan what the fan servicey film could have been. Yeah. Yeah. But it is a really good film. <laughs> it's really positive. The song at the end is an utter toe-tapper. There are moments of really good comedy throughout. Mm-hmm. There are some fun performances. There are elements of fan service that I really appreciate that absolutely tick the box for me, that work mm-hmm. in the way that they should work. So it's a solid 8 out of 10. Okay. And I don't know, because of how into this franchise I am, I don't know that it ever could have gotten a 10. I don't know that I'm just being mm. harsh because I know it's so well. Are there yeah. people, and yes, no, I'm, not, I'm saying are there people, of course there are people who watch those films in the 90s, really enjoyed them, haven't watched them since, haven't thought about Bill and Ted, suddenly new Bill and Ted comes out, and they're like, oh, that could be fun. And they come away going, that was amazing, because it felt like those those warm, slippery-type films that I remember from when I was young. <laughs> so it's possible I'm being very harsh. Maybe. I don't know. 
I mean, I am not the level of fan that you are, and I have a lot of the same issues with it that you do. Mm. Um, okay. I was sitting there, particularly during the therapist phase. <laughs> like, I feel the way the therapist looks. Okay. Right? Especially when they came back and started talking about the time travel yeah, and yeah, the princesses yeah. are from 1408, and she's just like... Um, so, yeah, I felt the way she looked throughout most of the film. Mm. But you're right. I did enjoy the film. Mm. A lot. Yeah. I, I would probably watch it again, honestly. I, I enjoyed it as much the second time. No, slightly less the second time because some of the comedy didn't land as well the second time. And we'll talk about okay. some of the really funny stuff. But because it is unapologetically positive at me and beating <laughs> me over the head with the world can be good and these girls are there to help their dad and when they're in trouble, the dads are going to help them. Which is what we want to see. In in the year of 2020 and 2021, we want to see good people doing good for good reasons. Yes. Frankly. I am I am here for shows and movies that do that thing. So yeah. it worked and it landed and the song at the end is an absolute ripper. And then the film ends. And it ends just... And, and then they save the world. Done. Yeah. Credits roll. Credits roll with all the stuff that I saw them on social media asking people to send them in videos. So oh, that they could okay. put a thing That's together. That That's was. actual, uh, and there are some famous people in there. They got to do it as well, mm -hmm. but it was just them on social media, like, "Hey, can everyone in the world send us a clip of you air guitaring, rocking out, doing Bill and Ted stuff?" This kind of thing, which I decided against because I did feel like it was going to be this sort of thing, mm -hmm. and I feel like it would change my feeling on the film to also be part of it. Yeah, I'm generic middle-aged white dude. I would much rather see interesting people get to put together costumes or funny shots for them doing it. You know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the daughters. Yes. Because I think they were the best part of the movie. And the uh, Ted's daughter, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Will <Wilhelmina. laughs> That took me a minute. <laughs> Dude, that actress embodied Keanu from the first movies. Like, she nailed it. Keanu didn't nail it, but she did. I think I agree. I I think they're doing something slightly different, which I appreciate. And I think it goes a little... Uh, uh, you're right. At times, it goes a little too close. Mm -hmm. Because, yes, they've clearly sat down and watched those films to try and get some of those mannerisms. Yeah, and it's it's some of the way they talk and it's the way they move, but it's not the way they think. No, absolutely. Because we yeah, learn yeah. that they are... I mean, the musicality in the family has clearly been passed down mm -hmm. to them, mm -hmm. but they have approached it in a much more academic kind of way. Mm -hmm. But they could also hold their own talking quantum physics at the end with the... Kid Cudi. I don't know who Kid Cudi is, but yes, that person. <laughs> Uh, scratch off one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> Not a clue. <laughs> so I enjoyed that because one of the things that we liked, that I really liked a lot about the first Bill and Ted was Bill being smarter than he acted. Mm -hmm. You know, because hmm. he, I mean, he had the big words and he had the cognition, the cognitive ability yeah. to be better mm -hmm. right but he was choosing not to be mm. which is i enjoyed that about him but this is not that this is these two girls are genuinely smart they know they're smart they excel at being smart mm -hmm. but they also have this affectation <laughs> that's weird and doesn't make sense in any world but <laughs> hey it's bill and ted so we're gonna do it yep i liked it I, I, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's an aspect of it that it is, they are standing on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. Because Bill and Ted have already come in with a certain level of musical knowledge and musical history knowledge. Mm -hmm. That their daughters pick that up from such a young age, they're able to iterate on it and take it to the next stage and the next stage. Right. And right. I dig that. Um, what do you think... Oh, is there any decent way of asking this? At the end of Bill and Ted's bogus journey, they go off to learn to play guitar. They come back. Mm -hmm. They're now married. They've got the ZZ Top. Um, or, or Bill's got a ZZ Top style mm -hmm. beard. Keanu looks like Keanu looked when he was in his band. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
and they've got little Bill and little Ted on them. Okay. Do you think when that that was written that those babies were girls? No. Do you think it matters that they are now girls? Matters? No. I completely agree. There are many times that we point out and we go, I wish there were more women in this film. Mm-hmm. Any of these characters could have been women. It wouldn't have changed it one jot. And I think that's exactly the same thing here. They could have been sons. They could have been daughters. It doesn't matter. And it's mm-hmm. good that they're daughters. Yeah. Just for a bit of equality in the thing. Just a bit of... Because otherwise it's lots of dudes. Mm-hmm. Great. Yeah. Well, and I like, you know, that that they have... like. Her name is Wilhelmina, but they still call her Billy or Bill. And, you know, Thea, but they call her Ted. Yeah. I, I like that the names are just different enough, but mm-hmm. it's still got shortened down to their dad's names. And they do the same thing that their dads do. They call them dads. Hey, dads. Yeah. Like, both of them are both of their dads. Yeah, absolutely. This you is know, this is a proper modern family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's... I en- enjoy that. I do. Like, mm. as as many issues as I have with the movie and how much I wish it was better, it was still so fun to watch and to be back in this world. Yeah, totally agree. That the, that fan service side of it works. Just in a, you know, this is, this is a decent franchise with decent yeah. ideas. Not decent enough at times, certainly in this one. And certainly when you think, like, the second film iterates on the first one. The first one's about time, so the second one's about heaven and hell and aliens. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to take it to. And now we go back into, it's about time. Fine. But it's a joy to watch. It's great. It's it's really enjoyable. And I had a smile, and I I found myself both times tapping my feet to the song at the end. Because it's a good song. The song at the end is enjoyable. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, It's nice. Yeah. A bit of fan service that does work for me is the reintroduction of death. Because if we're saying yes. Alex Winter is playing Bill exactly, mm-hmm. and Keanu is playing Ted and it doesn't quite work, William Sadler is playing death exactly. But it works. And it works. <laughs> and Like, it super works. Yeah. Part of that's the accent. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the accent was always an interesting choice in the first place. But his evolution, his grumpiness at them, the fact he obviously is a musician and can play. They've mm-hmm. they've sort of lent into that. It wasn't a fluke. It wasn't just a thing. And I, their scene together is great. And that his scene with the daughters is great. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. And I wholeheartedly agree. And he's only in the last like quarter or third of the film. Mm-hmm. So it's not too much. Yeah. Really enjoy it. He leads into one of my favorite lines. Go on. Um, he says, we haven't talked about the robot yet. Oh, coming to that. he says, let's <laughs> rock. And the robot goes, I really like the way you said that because it makes me want to rock. <laughs> like literally 30 seconds later. Really? Like when you said let's rock? Because it made me want to rock. You don't just get to rock. You have to feel it. <laughs> <laughs> I like the robot. I do. It it was an interesting addition, for sure. Um, felt kind of out of place, but the actor nailed it. Just like, just to finish off the death talk. Sorry, correctly, sorry, yes. Because um, he also has one of my favorite lines when the daughters are telling him how much they like his stuff. And he goes, don't fudge with me. <laughs> and it's the exact same way, like in uh, Bogus Journey. They, they tried to say, like, oh, that was a totally difficult game of Twister and that was totally heavy death ropes. Don't patronize me. Mm. You know, he's he's got the mannerisms of, and that's how people speak. They do use the same sort of phrasing over and over. And I, yeah, it works. You're and, for it. and the line, don't fudge with me. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> you just like doing the accent. I do. I do. It's good. <laughs> the death, Dennis Caleb McCoy. Who has a lot of feelings. Really weird addition. He was the thing that kept me going that first time. Okay. The bit where he kills them. I think it's when he kills the daughters and he's just like, oh, 
oh no oh yeah <laughs> well that was the moment that i started to like relate to him as a character and i realized he's more than just a death robot yeah because like, they absolutely they made this up. robot have feelings mm-hmm. they, they like, i don't know why totally made him this like terminator style scary dude and and fine and then suddenly he's like oh i keep getting it wrong oh man <laughs> <laughs> Yes. He's the bit that's not as funny as the second time. Okay. But where, where the impact with that was lost, to be fair. But it was so funny the first time. It really worked. Mm-hmm. It's it's reminiscent of, there's a show over here called Red Dwarf that I've told you about a number of times that has been going mm-hmm. on for 20, 30, 30 years now, in fact. That they're now doing this same stuff where they've got the original actors coming up against high-tech CG sci-fi aliens and robots and things. And it's a bit weird because I remember them with the guys who were made out of cardboard and the doc- the early Doctor Who alien type things. Right. That's the sort of thing they used to fight in the beginning. So it's a little bit... Anachronistic. Yeah. Well, there's, there's dissonance there of like, this show shouldn't look that good. Right. And the robot, it feels a bit like that. Like, what is this? This, this guy should be in a proper Netflix film. Mm-hmm. He's got that look to him. Not a yeah. Bill and Ted film. Yeah, he looked out of place. He was much more sleek and shiny than everything else was. Yeah. Especially whenever you put Bill and Ted and their wives back in the phone booths, mm-hmm. even though they clearly have other means of traveling through time. Mm-hmm. It just, it was cognitive dissonance. Yes. But he was very funny. I did like the twist with him, mm-hmm. and I generally enjoyed the performances. Yeah, he had some great one-liners and like his facial expressions mm-hmm. at times were great. Um, yeah, hmm. when he realizes that they had the song and he broke the song and so he can't, like, just like the look on his face when he's like, well, I have to kill myself now. <laughs> like, that whole scene was just wonderful. It really good. Really good. Yeah. Um, he is styled like the future dudes. As they're styled mm-hmm. in this one. And I like that we've always gotten slightly different versions of what the future looks like. Fine. Mm-hmm. I'm totally down with that. You know, Rufus in that first one is all grungy. Yeah. Sort of thing. And then he's all shiny. And it's all, you know, what the 90s pictured the future to be. And this is now a very sort of sci-fi J.J. Abrams future. Okay. Um, to wit, we meet Kristen Schaal as Kelly, the daughter of Rufus. Mm-hmm. Kristen Schaal is one of the funniest people i think it, she it, it, like there's only a couple of things she's ever done as big roles mm-hmm. um louise on uh what's it called bob's burgers i don't watch bob's you burgers. haven't watched bob's burgers have you watched any bob's burgers ever yes you know the small girl with the rabbit ears yes that's Kristen charl okay okay and she's in flight of the concords and many other things and she's hilarious Mm-hmm. So why is she in this film and given nothing to do? Actually, nothing. She gets to walk around and yell at her mom. Yeah. She had, she had, I think, one moment of actual comedy, and the rest of it was just her expositing. <laughs> yeah, I think she was there to remind us about Rufus. Yeah. Honestly. Mm. Because she invoked his name so many times. George Carlin's actual daughter was called Kelly. Is called Kelly. Oh, hmm. did not know that. But yeah, it's it's a shame to have someone that I know is capable of doing really fun, small personal comedy. The stuff on when you think back to the Flight of the Concords is really intense and really good. And she gets none of that. The best moment is when she's shouting at her mum and she finds out about the robot and she's like, Mom, you called him after my ex? Yes, I was actually getting ready to say that. That was her right. best moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's a shame. But I do also enjoy her on screen. So, again, it sort of added something. But, again, watching it back the second time, you go, uh... They, they could have done so much more with her. Give, give, give her something to react to rather than deliver. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. anyway. That's all I got. Okay. I was stopping Honestly, in pausing in case you had a... <laughs> no, I think that's all I got. I mean, I've talked about my favorite line. I've talked about the things I didn't like. Um... I mean, you did say that Keanu should have the beard all the time. My favorite Keanu in this movie was ripped Keanu mm-hmm. <laughs> with the beard and beard and hair. Mm-hmm. 
the beard works. He suits him. The only thing that I thought in in looking for it this time, that's what Dave Grohl now looks like. And Dave Grohl is in this film looking (laughs) like that. Mm-hmm. So it might have been a little, oh maybe you know. Although apparently they did try to get Eddie Van Halen for that part, and he mm-hmm. couldn't make it because he was ill, and then he passed away. So they got they were instead. Uh, yeah, it's a shame, and it's slightly weird him being in a shirt all the time. I I don't know. The shirt just makes him look more formal. Okay. Than certainly we used to as the character in a t-shirt or a, a, an open shirt or something like that. Right, right. Because it was a jacket. It or... was still a casual shirt, but it was a button-up shirt. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. It was proper button down, and it just it, it it looks more like someone going to an office. Yeah. Than you know someone hanging out. So I just mm. I'll tell you what's hilarious though. I'm giving you my sarcastic face. I'm pointing out this is going to be sarcastic. Do you know what's really funny? When they give him a massive gut and make him look really fat. (laughs) That's so funny. Oh, my God. And then he scratches it. Yeah. I love when films do that. Mm. Great. (sighs) Yeah. I mean, I think we agree. The worst bits of this movie were the Bill and Ted bits. Yeah. And that's unfortunate when it's a Bill and Ted movie, but... The rest of it was so fun. But the rest of it's good. And, and I don't think it, all the Bill and Ted bits are bad. The relationship the with Bill the Bill and Ted bits are. Oh, a, a large majority of them. Yeah, I'm, you know, they could do different things. Them in the buckets is great. <laughs> them in the buckets I really like. Um, the relationship with the princesses I really like. Mm-hmm. And I really like when they go back to them and they're like, where you yeah and you know and you do go and look for for better the versions of us and you never find them but we said we come here and we wouldn't make it worse, dude. I think we're making it worse. I think we are as well. Like <laughs> it, it's well done, it's well delivered, and I like a, a, a little bit like with the thing with the daughters forming it around the relationships is really good. Because mm-hmm. part of the part of the great thing about the that certainly the, certainly the first film is they are going to bring world peace and uh, you know a, a, an epoch of great wonderment for humanity and the planets are going to be in alignment if they pass their history test <laughs> you know it's got big world ending scale balance stuff going on but with a really small crisis right it's not we have to stop this guy who's going to blow up the city or something it's just we have to pass our history test and the second one has a bit the same but part of the problem there is that they die. So it's going to different places, but they have to get through Battle of the Bands. Right. This takes it to suddenly it is big world things if they can play a song, but it's always focused on things are going wrong in the world mm-hmm. and they have to stop it in a big sort of MCU-esque way. And when it doesn't do that and it focuses on you have to heal your relationship with your wives and your daughters, it's really good. It's so much better. Yeah. Yeah, to the point where they were willing to give up the song to go rescue yeah. their daughters. That, that is a great moment. Mm-hmm. Mm. Good stuff. Mm. But a fan service I did like is the return of Ted's dad. Okay. The Missy and Deacon stuff I can live without. Yes. The whole it... Missy the whole Missy joke has never been funny. Mm-mm. No, that's not true, actually. It's quite funny in the first one that it's a girl they asked to prom who's now married to Bill's dad. Okay. Do, I don't actually know, remember that, but there there is a joke in there and that's, you know, kind of fun of the sort of California scene as stereotyped in films. Mm-hmm. But by this point in this film it's not very good. Ted's dad, who's like, Okay, guys, you didn't try and travel, you didn't go to heaven and hell. You know, there are still people who doubt all this despite everything they have seen, everything's happened. Mm-hmm. You need to stop doing what you're doing. And then for him to have a reversal in the film of like, we're in hell. Which means you probably did go to hell. Which means you probably time traveled as well. I really should have supported you, shouldn't I? <laughs> is a good arc. Is a good twist for him, and he does then help them and try to do good things. Yeah. Mm. And again, I appreciated the small amount that he was in the film doing that thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, it was just enough. Mm. What else you got? The the other bit where we've not talked about is the musicians. Mm-hmm. Having someone play Jimi Hendrix was fine. The guy playing Louis Armstrong was really going for it. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, he was apparently quite a character, but... I mean, he I... was doing some hardcore face acting. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like it went a little far at times into into pastiche mm-hmm. rather than playing that character. In in the way in the way that the character of certainly Mozart was so reminiscent of Napoleon, Beethoven, Joan of Arc, and the other characters they got in those first in, in the first movie. Right. Really had some of that vibe of yeah, this is people who are just going with what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um and then doing it. And and I I, I in, enjoyed that it was now a romp through musical history. Mm-hmm. It felt a little bit too peaky. The the most significant people from each era we can think of. And then the founder of music. And then right. some cave woman who was an amazing drummer. I I get Yeah. Yeah, by the time we got to that point, I was thinking, I don't know if we should have done this. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed the idea that the girls had all of this knowledge at the drop of a hat. Like, it just lived in their head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of all of these amazing musicians and wanted to get them and took the initiative to go do it. Mm -hmm. Like, that story I enjoyed. But, you know, going further and further back in time... Was, uh... Like, uh, Lin Lun is, is established as one of the founders of music. Great. The point with Grom was that she was this amazing drummer because she was sending signals, I think. Was the sort of idea when she was drumming, she was passing on messages. Okay. I think I think it's supposed to evoke some of that idea. Which implies they don't necessarily have a written language. So how would we know of them if they can't write things down? And if I'm going to be picky about the time travel multiverse mm-hmm. stuff at the end, I'm going to be picky about the written right. language stuff and the historical things. I, I feel like there were more interesting ways of finding great drummers or something. Mm-hmm. But, you know, who knows? Yeah. Get get a dude from the future. Get the robot who suddenly has extra arms. Because that's the other thing with the robot is he's not actually integrated into it after that sequence in hell. Right. They send him away and we get to see him do his dance. Yeah, ever that's so briefly it. in the credits, yeah. and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas, just find a reason for him to be there. Just give me some, oh, and because they sent the robot back, that gives them their drummer. That actually would have been really good. G- given that would... he's the drum kit, the drum <laughs> drums on, because there's a guitar centre has all the other instruments, all the guitars and, and keyboards, but there's no drums in there. Well, I could be a drum kit. I can make my thing into all... Done. I honestly don't even think I noticed that. What's that? Oh, you're saying he could have. He could have, he yeah, because he okay. had the whole sort of thing like, that came out of him that? and <laughs> made him into a time traveling dude. Yeah. He's a sci fi future dude. He could have done that. Yeah. Mm. That would have made the whole idea that they tried to kill Bill and Ted to save the world make more sense. Mm-hmm. Because if he was there and was part of the song, trying to kill him did save the world exactly yeah it all came that to would have been nice mm. yeah yeah so all in all i think i recommend it i think i recommend it at least once but only if you watched and enjoyed the first two bill and ted's yeah i'm i'm not sure i would watch this as a trilogy you mean like one right after the other mm. like i would with a lord of the rings or a matrix right or other good trilogies it- it does benefit, I think, from having some time mm-hmm. between them. I think I can watch each of them separately mm-hmm. and and have a good experience. You could watch that first one absolutely fine. You could watch the second one absolutely fine. There was never any need for the third one, which is why there never was a third one. Mm-hmm. I think I'm more likely to watch the first or second one than watch this one again now. Yeah. Mm. Sage, uh, Joseph's son, was here today, and oh, yeah. he came in and saw how weird things were on the screen and he kind of got a little captivated by it and then he was like do you have to he didn't know who bill and ted were for starters oh man and it made me feel so i know i know i'm so (laughs) we're so old he had no idea who bill and ted were and so um and he asked do you have to watch those to watch this and i was like this movie is going to make no sense to anybody who's not seen the original two Mm. so yeah you have to watch the original two for this to make 
any sort of sense. It probably gives you enough to get by, but I don't know that it necessarily is improved or changed through not watching the first two. Hmm. I think I think watching the first two will make this one so much better it's worthwhile. Yeah, I don't know that normal people, quote unquote normal people, who had not seen the original Bill and Ted would even finish this movie because mm. I don't know that they'd get past the opening scene with Bill and Ted being the way they are. Possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, because part of that is all about us seeing them doing this weird music thing where mm-hmm. that means nothing to anyone who hasn't seen them before. Right. Mm, yeah. Interesting. So. All right. Anything else? Probably. There's probably other stuff I haven't mentioned. Oh, they, they, there's the thing for you. They have to play the song at 7.17. And when they look at their clock and it's 77 minutes, there are 77 minutes left in the film. Oh. I, I dig that. I did pause it. First time we watched that, I'm like, do you know, I bet they've done something clever here. Yeah, there's there's about 80 minutes left. Great. <laughs> really All happy right. with that. 7.17 is 69,420 seconds into the day. Okay. 69,420. <laughs> <laughs> It's okay. so childish, but it still makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And to be fair, I haven't checked that. It's entirely possible it's not true. But I read it on IMDb and I'm here to believe it. Okay. <laughs> you just want to keep finding things to talk about Bill and Ted forever, don't you? Yeah. I feel the whole bit with the, the princesses going through time to find a place where they could be happy with them. Mm-hmm. I find that weird because we don't see the older princesses. We see them from afar. And they're so covered up, glasses and hats and things. It makes me think, like, is that Bill and Ted pretending to do something with the princesses to convince them? Is that going to be a thing later on? Oh, God. But no, it absolutely seems like it is. (laughs) Future versions of the princesses, they just covered them up immensely for reasons. Mm. Yeah. It feels like there's a deleted scene somewhere that that just has a little bit more explanation on that. Mm-hmm. Mm. You have put way more thought into this movie than I have. <laughs> I think we can talk about that on any of our podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them, it's the opposite. Okay, sure. But it does swing this way more often than not, I think. <laughs> Are you waiting for me to ask the question, or are you going to keep talking about villains? I I can do both. I can do whichever way you want to go. The (laughs) therapist was the fairy godmother from the film Godmothered. I haven't seen that. She was significantly better here. I do not recommend Godmothered. It wasn't great. Okay. Mm. All right. We are running out of things to talk about this movie. (laughs) Clearly, if you're talking about movies like Godmothered. So, Matthew, what is up next on what will be the final movie that we watch for Pop Culturally Deprived. A final proper movie. Uh, we have to go out with something significant. We have to go out, go out with something major, something important to everyone. You always have to finish either on a bang or close the, the scene on a kiss. So we're going to finish on kiss, kiss, bang, bang. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't know you were going to do that. (laughs) Wow. I was desperately trying to remember what the line from Where Do We Go From Here is. The scene always ends on a kiss, isn't it? The curtains close on a kiss, God knows. curtains close on a kiss, that's it. Thank you. Yep, yep. So, (laughs) yes, we will be joined by guest Lonnie Diane Rich on our final episode. Mm. And I'm looking forward to it. The person who started it all. She did. The person who inspired both of us podcast. Mm. All right. So if you want to tell us how you felt about Bill and Ted Face the Music, please let us know. We are on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Eloquent Gushing. Or you can send an email to us at podcast at eloquentgushing.com. Or you can just, you know, talk to me on Twitter because I am at Mandy Kay. And I'm on Twitter at Matthew Vos. You sounded like you were about to start something antagonistic. Like, you can talk to me. Because I'm rational and don't bombard you with threads and gifs and things. <laughs> That's only because I don't have time to bombard people with threads yeah, and gifs and things. I, I, I do that when I have time. But if you like the idea of Mandy being antagonistic towards me, 
go and check out our new podcast, Movie Fight Club. You can find it on all good podcatchers where Mandy and I, once we wrap up Pop Culturally Deprived, we are going to be talking about films. But we're going to be arguing about films. We are going to be pitched in battle on our different sides over the different films we watch. So go and look up Movie Fight Club and you can download our intro episode and new episodes will be dropping in the spring. And we're quite excited to get to that as well. Yes, very much so. So I can win every episode. <laughs> it's picked at random. There's no way you can win every episode. There is a way you can win every episode if the random thing is... Because if it was so random, it is possible for you to win every episode. I mean, are you questioning my skills at being persuasive, even when I don't believe what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> you are in for a treat, Matthew. Pop Country Deprived is completely funded by listeners like you through Patreon. Anything you can give, even $1 a month, it gives access to exclusive content. It gives you early access to things. It gives you merch and all sorts of stuff sent to you. And it helps us to develop our shows, such as Movie Fight Club. Go and check out Movie Fight Club on your podcast, Country of Choice. And if you want to find out more about supporting us on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash eloquentgushing. And we will be back next week with one more movie where we will talk about Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Until then, I am Andy Kay. And we love you. Pop Culturally Deprived is an Eloquent Gushing production. For more information, go to eloquentgushing.com or find us on Twitter at eloquentgushing.